Hi everyone, welcome to week 12. I'm Professor Rios, hope you're doing well. This week we move to the part of the uh, geomorphology block that goes over shaping agents and landscapes. So just like the first portion of the uh, material was having to do with constructive events like subduction zones and faults and boundaries and volcanoes, now we are dealing with those agents that take that built up land and shape it away. So let's get going with part one. Here you see uh, a hanging, what's called a hanging um, valley. Yosemite Valley, uh, a landscape that is largely formed by glaciers, obviously water, but glaciers for a long period of time. So we'll get into that a little bit later on. These are the objectives for the lesson. So we're dealing with things like erosion and weathering and mass movements. Again, these are the agents that shape land. So there you have water, wind, ice, water in the form of fluvial landforms or rivers, underwater, water, or underground water rather, waves, the seashore, glacial landforms, and of course wind, and water in desert regions. So lots and lots of opportunities there. The shaping agents, you have the tectonic processes that built up the land into the landforms that you see, like the Himalayas and the Andes and the Rockies and so on. And then you have the events like weathering, mass movement and erosion that take that material, weather it and move it away somewhere else and deposit it. So that's the basic idea here. Of course, sea level as it stands today, obviously sea level is variable depending on climatic conditions around the globe. So first weathering, it is a function of temperature, precipitation, the material that something is made of, whether it be difficult to erode like basalt, or, the, although, or whether it be easy to, to erode away like sand. Uh, it is the in-place disintegration of rock material. Erosion is the is a function of the agent that does the gradation. So that's water, wind, and ice. So it's the movement of that weathered material away. And of course, mass movement is mostly a function of gravity and precipitation. Precipitation is not necessary. It helps, but it is mainly a, a function of gravity. That's the, the, the most significant uh, aspect of it. Here's the best example of erosion and weathering that I can think of, the Grand Canyon. Uh, think about, you know, this material was at one point uplifted, and then water went to work on the different layers that were laid down. If you've ever been to the Grand Canyon, um, you know what I'm talking about. If you haven't, I really, really highly recommend you go. Uh, it is something that every American for sure, but every person should try to do once. It is an absolutely is as stunning as it looks in that image, and the image can't even come close to doing it justice. Uh, you can tell the power of water even in an absolutely dry environment like this desert. You see where the water made a channel. So even in dry environments, water is the most significant gradational agent there is. Um, mass movement. So here's an image of Yosemite Valley in California, and it is the downslope movement of material that's been broken down and it falls in response to gravity and it is usually aided by water, but water is not a necessary uh, ingredient. This is El Capitan here in California. This is half dome in the distance. For a bit of reference, you could fit three Empire State Buildings and still not make it to the top. That's how big this is. 
So it's difficult to get a sense of scale because it's just an image, but it is a remarkably enormous set of um, granite boulders, basically, that have been uplifted over time. Here are some examples of mass wasting and movement away, so sand dunes. When you look at the water in this river, how it looks very sort of like milk, chocolate milk. And of course, the response of trees and other material in uh, when too much rainfall happens, and how that can sort of break down and fall down. Weathering, you have two types. You have mechanical weathering and you have physical chemical. So it's mechanical and or physical and chemical weathering. So we'll get into what each of these happens to be. Physical weathering is the physical disintegration of material without any change in chemical composition. The most common is called frost action. When you have salt wedging, exfoliation, and there's a few others. So uh, physical weathering or mechanical, think about water getting into a crevice then freezing and expanding, and then you can literally fit this piece of rock into this here, like a jigsaw puzzle. And look at this image here. This is high elevation. So this implies a cold climate. Obviously, you can see the snow. So maybe during the day, the some of that snow melts, and the liquid then freezes again it expands and it breaks up the rock you can tell it is physical and mechanical weathering because the rocks are jagged they have sharp angles it's not rounded river of rock like you expect to find uh, on a stream bed here's another example of the accumulation of broken down material this happens to be in Ellesmere Island in northern, northern Canada, obviously a very, very, very cold place. And you can see all this material that's been accumulated at the bottom of this hill came from up here somewhere, and it's accumulated over millennia. Here's a good example of frost wedging. Notice how the rocks have basically broken along a weakness. And so the water seeps in, it freezes, it expands about 10% in size, and basically it functions like a jackhammer, breaking the rock apart. Here's an example of exfoliation. Again, this is caused by the release of confining pressure that's, pressure that's been exerted on the rock below it. And when that pressure is released, the rocks peel off in curved slabs. So here's an example. This may have been underground with pressure of soil and dirt above it. So it basically holds it in place. When this is uplifted and exposed, so imagine this is now this. Now that expansion has been that confining pressure has been released and the rock can slowly begin to peel away. One of the best examples of that is found in Yosemite National Park in California. Here you see one, two, three, four, five, six of them. The most famous example is Half Dome. And to give you a sense, of how big this is. This right here is a fully grown pine tree, like what you would find in Rockefeller Plaza on Christmas. So this is a really, really, really tall piece of granite. That's what you're seeing here. You can hike this on the back, by the way. Salt wedging is like frost wedging, but weaker. Uh, the salt basically forms, the salt crystals form, and they expand, 
and as they expand and grow, they break up the rock. It's usually common in dry places, like where you tend to have BW or even BS type climates. So in the United States, you would find this in Arizona, in Southern California, in New Mexico, in West Texas, in Utah, Nevada. That's where you would find it. Other physical processes would be like root prying, which is basically the idea of roots or trees growing in seemingly impossible places like the crack of a rock. And over time, that root is powerful enough to slowly pry away the rock. That's a physical process where the rock is broken down. Chemical weathering. Chemical weathering is the chemical alteration of rock material. Um, the, the rates tend to be high in wet, warm climates, so A climates, AF, AM. And they tend to be much lower in cold deserts and cold lands where there's little water available. There you see three examples carbonation, oxidation, and hydrolysis. So where does it come from? So you think about rainwater, water is mostly, is always acidic because you're combining H2O plus carbon dioxide, CO2, to form a weak acid called carbonic acid, H2CO3. Natural rainwater is normally acidic around 5.5, Really bad acid rain is usually somewhere in the three to four range. Carbonic acid reacts with calcium and dissolves it quite quickly. And you think about something like limestone. Limestone is about 90% calcium. Think about the state of Florida. Florida tends to have a lot of um, sinkholes because Florida is a big, big chunk of limestone. Here's an example of how it looks like on a map. So there, that map, you see lots of little dimples. These little circular, these are depressions and these are basically sinkholes. That's a sinkhole right there in Florida. Here's another one. Oxidation is another chemical reaction. So think about the idea of uh, fro uh, frost, rust, so iron plus oxygen equals iron oxide. And in this image here in Utah, what you're seeing here is water reacting with iron in the rock. And then the rust bleeds out. And what you're seeing there is this darker color. Mass movement. So landslides, creeps. Uh, I know that's a funny term, right? Creeps, but there's a there's an explanation for that rock slide mudslides and so on so mass movement you think about there's this thing called the angle of repose and that is basically the steepest angle at which a given kind of material will remain stable beyond that angle it'll fail and slide down so here's an example of different types of mass movements whether they be slow like this one here, it's called creep because it creeps along slowly or it can be very dry and fast or anywhere in between. So here's an example of one. This is a river in Pakistan, the Kashmir region. And there you see how that material fell very quickly and it basically changed the pathway of this river. Here's an example of a mud flow in China. So this is very wet and very fast. Difficult to get away from this. Here's one that is a little bit wet, a little slower than a mud flow, but definitely faster than something like creep. So there is there are several videos on the YouTube uh, playlist that highlight all of these from fast dry to fast wet and everything in between so i highly recommend you watch them they're very short two to three minutes so you're not going to be spending a lot of time but they really do show them quite well 
So I highly recommend that. Now, the second part of the lesson is fluvial systems and the landscapes that are associated with each. All right. Let's go ahead and minimize that. Nope, there you go. So part two here. All right, so this here is the San Juan River in Colorado. Uh, it's a very unique river. Notice how it's done a lot of erosion work on the different layers that have been laid out over time. It isn't quite as deep as the Grand Canyon, but it is nonetheless impressive. So these are the lesson objectives. So shaping the landscape. Here we're dealing with running water. And most, most of the Earth's landscapes are shaped by running water, even desert regions. That is something you need to remember. Even in deserts, the most significant agent of erosion is water. Okay. So look at this image here. This is the Indus River in the desert of Pakistan. Notice there's water flowing, but look at the region around it. It is clearly a desert, right? You don't see a single tree anywhere. So the idea here is this water comes from somewhere else. In the case of the Indus River, it comes from the Himalayan mountains. So that's the source of the water. So it doesn't matter that it's flowing through a desert. The water source is far away. Here's an example of, of basins in the United States, the most significant one being the Mississippi River Basin. So everything in the shaded green area falls, that, every bit of rain that falls in that sh green shaded area empties through the Mississippi Delta. So all these different rivers, the Ohio, the Missouri, the Colorado, the Arkansas, by the way, there's a second Colorado, the Arkansas, the Red, the Platte, uh, the Tennessee, all these rivers empty through the Delta of the Mississippi. Everything east of this red line empties into either the Gulf or Atlantic. Anything west of this red line empties into the Pacific Ocean or the Gulf of California right there. Okay, it's called the Continental Divide. So some basic tenets of water. It takes the path of least resistance, yeah, I think you know this, and it erodes and it transports material as the function of its velocity. So if something, if water is very, very fast, it can take with it big chunk of material and it can take away lots of stuff for a very long distance. However, as water velocity slows, a lot of that material falls off as deposition. So let's look at the idea of erosion, transport, and deposition. So here's the idea of stream erosion. There are three factors, hydraulic action, abrasion and corrosion. This is chemical weathering. This is like sandblasting. And this is simply the force of water. So imagine a trickle of water doesn't do a lot of damage. But if you put your finger at the end of a hose, you can literally force that water out faster. And you can do a little bit more work with it. So water is a remarkably powerful substance. And a lot of that is dependent on its velocity and what material is found within it. So there are different kinds of transport options. You have dissolved load. Think about a glass of water with a teaspoon of salt. If you dissolve it well enough, you're never going to see the salt. It will still look clear even if it tastes salty. Suspended load is the majority of material. 
And that is think about a muddy river like the Mississippi River, the Missouri River, or the Yellow River in China. They look really, really obvious. And then you have at the bottom bedload, which are the big chunks of items that are carried as a function of it's called saltation and traction. So let's look at some of these. Suspended load found here. And then this is either traction getting dragged along the bottom or saltation skipping along the bottom. All right. Here's an example. So think about the idea of velocity. Think about what water flow speed would it take to be able to move these big, big boulders. You may not be able to move these boulders if you try, maybe some of these smaller ones, but this big boulder here, this is about the size of a desk. So imagine the amount of water needed to be able to move this. Okay, the same thing goes with this image here on the right. Look at this image here. This is an image of a river in the northeastern United States. Notice how the river looks like chocolate milk. This isn't polluted. It's just full of sediment. This clearly shows you a place that's had a lot of rain. And that rain has scoured away a lot of the dirt from the bottom of the rivers and it's carried it forth along its channel. That's suspended load. So here's the, the, the basic ideology. When velocity decreases, the capacity and the competence of a stream will decrease. That is the ability to carry material, big material, and carry that material for a long distance. And sediment will fall and sort by size. So here is an example of what's called an alluvial fan. Notice the road. This is a road. You can drive your car here. So that gives you a sense of size. So what's happening is when it rains, the water comes down really fast through this channel, but then the channel opens up and the water begins to fan out. That creates this alluvial fan. It's very distinctive. You find these all over the world. The, the higher you are or the closer to the mouth of the canyon, the bigger the pieces. And by the time you get way down here, the pieces are almost the size of peas or smaller. Okay. Here's another example of an alluvial fan. Do you see the power of water? Do you see the many channels that water took? The water came down these channels very fast. It was funneled. And then the canyon ended and then the water went in this direction, in this direction, in that direction, in this direction, and in this direction. And it creates a very distinctive fan shape. Stream types. Two main types that I want you to focus on, meandering and braided. So a meandering stream has curved loops. Sometimes you find abandoned channels and you tend to find them in places where the land is flat. So here's a good example from Southeast Texas. Notice how the river meanders about. Sometimes it leaves behind a little bit of a lake called an oxbow lake, and then it continues. It's a very classic meandering stream channel. Here's another one from Alaska. Lots of former channels that have been left behind. An oxbow lake is when a lake gets left behind. So like 
this one. Let's go back. Here we go. Right here. That's an oxbow lake. That's an oxbow lake. This is an oxbow lake. So here's position A, position B, C, and D. You see the evolution going on there? Now, a braided stream is a little bit different. You tend to find these in places where there's a lot of seasonal water discharge differences between winter and summer. You tend to find these in places where there's a lot of heavy uh, load of material, like sand and gravel. And because the water is variable, depending on the time of year, you get this sort of interlocking pattern of different channels. So here's a good example of one. Notice it's not one distinctive river. It is a river with little islands that are often vegetated and the water has to sort of find its way through it. Here's another one in Alaska, in the vicinity of a glacier. Notice that the water looks almost gray. It's full of sediment. And notice how the water sort of has to find its way through all these different bars of gravel and sand. Here's another great image, and you see it a little bit more clearly, the different bars. And you can see the, the different size material here. The water has to sort of find its way through it. This is clearly in the vicinity of a glacier. And a glacier is a perfect place for a, a braided stream because a glacier has variable water flow, more in summer when it's warm, less in winter when it's frozen, and a glacier is actively grinding down the earth, so it carries with it a lot of material. Here's the idea of valley widening, so the creation of a floodplain. So a floodplain is flat, and by the way, that is part of the homework using Google Earth. Uh, so over time, the river will occupy every place in the floodplain as the river sort of changes uh, direction with time. So it's a very significant fluvial landform. Uh, floodplains tend to be places that are great for agriculture because the soils are very rich. I wouldn't want to build a home there because guess what? They flood. Get it? Flood plain. Uh, it's a natural process. It's just something that you have to deal with. Uh, if you're a farmer, it's just part of the it's part of the deal, basically. Here's an example of a floodplain. There you see the river. This happens to be in Utah. So here you have higher terrain on this side. You have mountains on this side. And you have this meandering stream. And notice how flat the land is here. Notice how you can see the agricultural pattern, too. Here's an example of a flooded floodplain. Can you see the river? See it here? So the river flooded and the water occupies the flood plain. This area that's flooded is flat. The area on either side is hillier, so it's not flooded. These are some other river features, a point bar and a cut bank. So where the water is moving fast, it cuts away. So it's deeper and where the water is slow, it deposits a sandbar. So you tend to have sandbar or point bar, cut bank, point bar, cut bank, point bar, cut bank, point bar, cut bank. They, they, they oppose each other, basically. And this again here is a meandering stream. A delta. A delta is a seaward expansion of a valley. Uh, the most exam the most significant ones are the Egypt uh, Nile River Delta, 
and the Mississippi Delta at the end of the Mississippi River system in southeastern Louisiana. Okay, so a stream slows down, it reaches sea level, and as it opens into the ocean, if there is no strong current, it deposits it into the delta shape, which is like a little triangle. These are former delta locations along the Mississippi River. And here's the Mississippi River through New Orleans. And there is, notice, this is the uh, New Orleans right here, the Mississippi River. Notice how much material is being carried out of that delta. So that river is full of sediment that then goes into the Gulf of Mexico and towards the bottom of the ocean. All right, so that's the lesson for this week. Next week, we get into karst uh, topography. Uh, again, if you have any questions, uh, let me know. Come to the live office hour or send me a question by email, whatever works for you, and then we'll go from there. Otherwise, I hope you're doing well, and we'll talk to you soon. Bye.